So we've studied cardiac muscle. We saw that it differed from other muscle because it branched, right? It had intercalated discs, right, to facilitate impulse conduction so you can get the whole heart contracting at once. So it had its characteristics. The heart embryologically started off as a blood vessel. So in the embryo, the heart was a modified blood vessel. That's an embryo. And it'll differentiate then from the blood vessels in forming valves and chambers and other things. And we'll see the similarities in structures in some ways and extremely different in other ways. But no matter what way we design it, what's the main function of the heart? It's a pump. We mentioned that previously for your full 100 years. It's a very efficient pump. We divide our circulation into pulmonary circulation and systemic circulation. Pulmonary circulation. and systemic circulation. So with pulmonary circulation, we're going to go from the heart to the lungs, back to the heart. So we have a four-chambered heart. with a right atrium a left atrium a right ventricle right ventricle and a left ventricle. So we're going to take the heart to the lungs. So we'll come out from our right ventricle. We're just going to put it crudely in here. I'm going to have to erase this, though. I don't want that there. This will go to lungs. And then the oxygenated blood will come back from the lungs. into our left atrium. We'll get this all in detail once we develop it. I'm just giving the basic principles of the difference between pulmonary circulation and systemic circulation. With sy systemic circulation, we go from the heart. Let me put this over so I can draw on this one. Heart. To the body, back to the heart. So we'll come out and do it this way. Take this this time out of here and come around. So this is our left ventricle. 
will come around and break up in the body. This will be body down here. This will be an artery. Bringing oxygenated blood to the body. Then venous blood collecting, coming around. And coming into our right atrium. But these are capillaries. small blood vessels, and this, these will be veins represented here. But it gives the idea of a circulatory system coming from the heart, taking the oxygenated blood to the body, and then back in to the heart again to eventually go off to the lungs. But it's a beautiful process that's going on every second as you sit there, right? So now, what is the size of your heart? Just about everybody knows the size of your heart. How do you tell the size? Just one of them. Right. Size of your fist. It shows you've got a big heart. He's got two fists. So for size, it's simple. Size of, of fist. So on average, that gives us five inches times three inches. This is length. This is width. What other organ in your body is the size of your fist? Nope. Good guess. Nope. Good guess. Nope. The question is, what other organ in your body is the size of your fist? Nope. Nope. <laughs> no, it's not an organ. <laughs> your spleen. You never think about your spleen, do you? You'll learn about your spleen, but it's the size. So now, where is your heart? What is its location? Um, looks like our pink chalk is more permanent. <laughs> All right, we've got the, this is the location. I'm sorry, but it doesn't come off. We're going to find it posterior to the sternum. So let's put in our sternum with our sternal notch. Always reviewing and we'll have the first costal cartilage Second one right at the sternal angle, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, that's convenient, seventh. So we'll have the base of the heart just inferior to the sternal notch. Base inferior to sternal notch. So we can put it in. I don't want to use that pink. It doesn't come off. Should we have a green heart then? <laughs> Normally I'd do a pink one. but So we're going to bring it around. The base is up here. 
and we'll have it one third to the right of the midline and we're going to come down to the sixth intercostal space here so we're going to try to take it one third around this way and coming around this way and the apex is going to be at the fifth intercostal space let's put a something like this here we're going to put in the apex of heart and bring this down here to the fifth intercostal space and bring it around like this so we've put the position of our heart like this how do we know where to put the apex in the fifth intercostal space it's inferior to the left nipple so get at your left nipple and just drop down to the fifth intercostal space and that will be your apex so this line here this left nipple here All right, now let's give another relationship of the heart as we're looking at its location. It's found in an area called the mediastinum. Have you ever heard of the mediastinum? Mediastinum. The mediastinum is the area between the two lungs. So if we put in, let's put in the diaphragm. And the right lung. Comes down like this. And the left lung comes down like this. It leaves what's the cardiac notch. They come down to the, I sort of shortchanged it a bit, it's not that much smaller. This is right lung. Left lung. And we're going to put our heart in here. And as I said, the area between the two lungs is called the mediastinum. What other structures do we have in the mediastinum? We'll have one, then the heart. Two, the great vessels coming in and out of the heart. We'll just sort of put them here as representatives. This was one. This is two. Great vessels. We'll learn all these. And then we'll have the trachea that we'll be bringing in air. This will be three, trachea. Next will be the bronchi, which are taking the air from the trunk, the trachea. So we're going to take some bronchi coming out, just diagrammatically like this at the moment. So these will be four bronchi then five 
How is our food getting from the back of your mouth down to your stomach? Via the esophagus. So five is going to be the esophagus, but it's pretty tough to put it in because it's posterior here. So we'll just put five up here. We'll be coming behind esophagus. Six, we'll have the thoracic duct. Thoracic duct. We'll see it when we study the lymphatic system. Thoracic duct. It will be bringing up lymph. Carries lymph. You don't know lymph yet, but just give it a little function. Then we'll have the phrenic nerve. Phrenic nerve. And cardiac nerves. And they'll just be in this same area. I'm just letting you know what a vital area this is in the mediastinum here. All these critical tissues going through. And we've got one more. These will be lymph nodes. So now you know what the mediastinum is. I saw one former medical student here, and he said he never forgot his professor's lecture on the mediastinum. He said it was so beautifully done. Isn't that something? So, but that's the way he felt about it. All right. Now, where do we want to go from here? We'll do our, I think we've got our, we've done size where it's the walls of the heart. Your blood vessels have three layers. Then the heart has three layers. Walls of heart, three layers. We'll have the outer layer. is the epicardium. Epi upon, upon the heart. The middle layer is muscle, so what are you going to call it? Myocardium, sure. And you studied myocardium. Epicardium has many names. We'll see in a moment when we talk about the <coughs> protective coverings of the heart. We'll just leave it at this. And then the inner is called what? Endocardium. Endocardium. So we'll see that it's a type of epithelium. They call them endothelial cells, specifically, but it's a type of epithelium again. Endothelial cells. So this is your inner lining that's going to be continuous with the blood vessels. So it's very important to know if you're going to have a heart transplant that you get a smooth continuity between the chambers of the heart and the lining of your blood vessels. The endothelial cells are same in blood vessels. All right, that gives you the general idea of this is just the muscle mass that pumps. You ask little kids what's more important to you, the brain or the heart? Which would you choose? 
pretty hard, isn't it? They're both important for what they do. All right, let's look at coverings. We're going to have three layers of coverings. outer is going to be a tough, fibrous layer. I need a CT. So if we put our heart, again, very basic descriptive heart. And we have the diaphragm down there. And we'll put in our outer fibrous layer. going to be attached to the diaphragm. Bring it around. Tough, fibrous layer. Then we have what? Did I hear somebody? Or they just sneezed? <laughs> just sneezed. OK. Sorry. I thought you had a question. Then the other layers, two and three. This one is the parietal layer. And this one is the visceral layer. These are terms we introduced in the first terminology lecture. So the parietal layer. means wall, it's going to be adherent to this tough fibrous layer. It's made of mesothelial cells, just simple epithelium, mesothelial cells. And we have the visceral layer, which is attached to the viscera, which is the heart itself. It's a hollow organ. That's viscera. So the visceral layer will be attached to So these are all protective coats of the heart. It's also made of mesothelial cells. So which layer here is comparable to the visceral layer? <coughs> Endocardium is lining the heart. What's epi mean? Upon. So the epicardium is mesothelial cells. It's another name. As we've learned, lots of things have lots of names here. So this is the outer layer on the heart muscle. See, underneath this, we'll have heart muscle, right? I'm not going to fill it in, but that's muscle. And the outer layer of the heart was called the epicardium, or the visceral layer. And these layers are all part of the pericardium. So 
So one, two, three. Peri means around. So they make up the pericardium surrounding the heart. More protection. And we have between the parietal layer and the visceral layer, what do we call the area between the parietal layer and visceral layer? <coughs> Pericardial cavity. So between parietal and visceral, we have the peri, the cardial cavity. And what's in that cavity? Big generic term, what do you want there? Fluid. Pardon? Fluid, sure. You want to reduce friction every time that's, so this contains what's called a serous fluid. And I never know why they called it that. Serous refers to moist. <laughs> Who knows? But that's what you'll see. Serous fluid in the pericardial cavity. And then again, just like we had in our synovial joints, we had synovial fluid to reduce friction. Because if this is all the time contracting, we want to reduce friction. And so you have fluid. So that gives you an introduction to these protective coverings. And it makes it fairly easy for a heart transplant, too, that it's so well encased in this tissue and membranes. So now, with this brief introduction, let's look at the chambers and the vessels. So we need a whole page for this. We'll get started, see how far we go. Isn't that funny? Why is it so persistent? I wonder if they're all, excuse me while I do a little experiment. That was just that piece of chalk. Been soaked in oil or something. I don't know. Anyhow. All right, now we want to do a big heart. And we want to put in our chambers. And we'll, this is again cartoon. It's not going to be. Refined. Our left atrium, our right atrium, our right ventricle, and our left ventricle. So this is our one is right atrium. The posterior wall of the right atrium will be smooth. The anterior wall of the right atrium will have folds of myocardium in the wall. Folds 
of myocardium. See, if you're going to do design artificial hearts, you have to know how basic, very simple principles are. There's obviously something for the flow of fluid to have one wall smooth and the other wall full of folds. They call these folds pectin excuse me, <coughs> pectinate. Pectinate muscles. And we're just going to make this, uh, we'll put it both right and left so we don't have to repeat right and left atria. We have right and left, then it's plural, I-A instead of I-U-M, just to save time and space. They'll both look like this. Now we have what's called the oracle. What does oracle mean? Ear. They call this part the oracle of the external ear, right? So we have what's called an oracle here. And here's a problem for you that I want you to bring me back an answer to. Why do we have an oracle? An oracle. is a conical appendage to the atria. And we'll see it difficult to draw because this is two-dimensional, but it will be attached to the right atrium. And we'll just put this sort of conical flap in here like this. When you see the real oracle, you'll see it looks much different. But this is the best I can do. This flap. So this will be two. And this will be two. And my question to you is, what is the purpose of this oracle? Has anybody ever been taught in your classes? This little pouch that's attached to the atrium. It's very rough. So it's got pectinate muscle in it. What in the world is it doing? I've asked cardiovascular surgeons. I've asked all sorts of physiologists. Nobody knows. And yet it's a major structure there. We don't know why it's there. So my assignment to you is to find out and come back and teach the class. All right? Is it fun to have an assignment instead of just sit there learning? All right. Let's see which ones we want to take next. What are we going to do for three? We're going to take the intraatrial septum. So that tells us this is going to be three. Intraatrial, it's between the two atria, and it's a septum. Now it has in its wall a fossa. So we know a fossa is a depression. So we're going to have a depression here. And that depression is called what? The fossa ovale. Fossa ovale. Why do we have that depression? Because when you were a fetus, your right atrium was connected to your left. You didn't need to use lungs. It just went right through. There was in the fetus a foramen ovale between the two atria. In fetus, a foramen ovale. 
and at birth it closes because you've got to start using your own lungs and just leaves a depression. So when you're looking for the normal structure of the heart, it's not pathology to see this dent here. That's a basic structure from an embryological condition. So that tells us about the, I want to be sure to get these for you, the atrial openings. What openings are coming into the atrium? You've got to be bringing blood in from a superior to the what, Where is it going to be bringing it from? superior to the diaphragm. So if we have our heart, I'm just going to make another one quickly because I'll get it too filled. And I'm just going to do this. And we want our right atrium. So we're going to bring in a vessel, bringing venous blood in. So this will be number four. What do we call this vessel that's bringing in venous blood superior to the diaphragm? Superior vena cava, sure. This is the superior vena cava. And it's bringing in blood, blood from areas superior to the diaphragm. Can you picture your diaphragm in here? Base of your lungs? So everything up coming in from the superior vena cava. Then we have the inferior vena cava bringing all the venous blood in from the areas. This will be five. inferior vena cava. So this will be blood inferior to diaphragm. Now we'll see how many have heard of the third opening into our right atrium. Does anybody know what it is? Pardon? You're close. Coronary sinus. Right. In between the entrance of the superior vena cava and the inferior vena cava, we have the coronary sinus. So this will be six. Six is the coronary sinus. And so what structure have we not drain blood from? Heart. So the coronary sinus is bringing in the venous blood from the myocardium. Right. This is venous blood from myocardium. So that's a lot coming into our right atrium, right? Can you picture your right atrium? Any idea? Is it here? Is it here? Is it here? Is it here? Roughly, if somebody asks you, sure, right there. So now we've had all of those. Now in the left atrium, what do we have? We have four vessels coming in. Very diagrammatic again. And these will be, where are we, six, will be seven.
and these will be pulmonary veins. The pulmonary veins are bringing oxygenated blood from the lungs to the left atrium. So oxygenated blood from lungs to left atrium. So we've brought in all the venous blood into this side. We're bringing oxygenated blood into this side. Now we've got to get this venous blood into the lungs. So it's going to go out what's called a pulmonary trunk. A pulmonary trunk is going to go out. And it's going to divide into a right and left pulmonary artery. So we have eight is a pulmonary trunk. And we'll divide into a right and left pulmonary artery. Now, what do you think of that? What's your usual definition of an artery or a vein? Pardon? Going away from the heart. What's going away from the heart? An artery, yes. We call this a trunk here, but it's going into an artery, and is this blood in the right ventricle venous blood or arterial blood? Venous blood, sure, and yet it's in an artery. So you find these things, right? Because this was venous blood coming in here, superior vena cava, inferior vena cava, coronary sinus comes down into, thank you, right ventricle, and then we'll go out a pulmonary trunk, and then this is the right pulmonary, whoops, artery. This one over here was the left pulmonary artery, but they're carrying venous blood. So now we have one more to give. Let's give the blood coming from the left ventricle. I'll do it in a different color, taking it out this way. What's the vessel leaving the left ventricle? What part of the aorta? The ascending aorta, right. Ascending aorta. So we got through, briefly, our circulation to the heart. We have receiving the venous blood in our atria here, receiving the arterial blood coming from the lungs here, coming venous blood here to go to the lungs, and the arterial blood here to go to the rest of the body. Let's look at some slides. First slide, please. Here we are. Here's our mediastinum. Here's our right lung. You can see the right lung is larger than the left because we have the cardiac notch here. Here's the diaphragm. I didn't put in the thymus gland. I should have. 
perhaps many other structures, but this is the heart. In the next one, and here you see the heart with its apex. The oracle shows here, and we can see the pericardial cavity here with the visceral pericardium adherent to the heart, and then the parietal pericardium, and then the tough fibrous layer that's going to be attached to the diaphragm. The tough fibrous layer is continuous with the vessels as they're leaving. Here we've removed the heart, so you can see with the heart transplant what has to be cut to take the heart out and put in the next person. Anybody know anybody with a heart transplant? Don't see it, no. Next one. And then we haven't gone, gone far enough here, but this is, is useful to show you how smooth the posterior wall is and then the pectinate wall here and the superior vena cava coming in here and this looks like it should be the coronary sinus here. They don't have one that has the inferior vena cava, but very different. When we get to the ventricles, we have very rough walls, both anterior and posterior. But we'll continue with that next time. So have a lovely weekend.